Welcome. Let me share my screen and we will officially get started with our fourth of seven Pub 101 meetings. That means uh, this is the turning point. We're just about halfway there. And welcome back. This is Pub 101 with the Open Education Network. Glad that you are here as always. Our time together today, I will quickly, you know, talk about where we are in the process and briefly touch on project management. Then we will spend the majority of our time um, talking about call for proposals. And we're going to do an independent reflective exercise uh, about call for proposals as a matchmaking tool. And then Karen is going to tell us everything she knows about CFPs. So where are we? We have moved into the build publishing program phase of Pub 101. You'll remember that last week with Amanda, we spent some time assessing and planning your program capacity. I sent out that capacity scan for each of you to do if you wanted to just think about some different questions about whether you might be um, able to support publishing now or in the future. And now we're really moving into number two, launching a program. And when you launch your program, it's a great opportunity to communicate that capacity and your expectations for the people you will be working with, whether we're talking about faculty authors or organizational partners. And two great vehicles to do that are the CFP and the MOU. The MOU we will talk about next week. Then uh, we'll spend a meeting talking about uh, communicating as the project progresses. And then we'll talk about celebrating completing projects as we celebrate the completion of Pub 101 in just a few weeks. So last week, we sort of unofficially and without much fanfare started talking about project management. Um, and, and I say that because Amanda talked a lot about defining publishing support. She talked about those two different models, the DIY model and a more editorial services based model. And so much of what goes into deciding what model is right for you is this process of what am I prepared to manage uh, if I am the project manager. And a lot of you are, are librarians, some of you are instructional designers, and some of you are faculty authors. And in any one of those three roles, you will likely find yourself as a project manager to get that book to completion. It just might look a few different ways depending on what publishing model you're working within. So I just really wanted to acknowledge this is the bulk of what we're going to spend our time talking about project management, doing the publishing support and uh, what it is that you're going to be up to and other uh, people may be up to in their roles. Of course, it's all in the details and as project managers, you juggle those details. There are a ton of decisions to make about your program or if you're saying Gosh, Karen, how many times do we have to say, we don't wanna do a program, we're just here to learn. Fair enough. I will say that uh, these details also pop up if, if you're supporting a project. If you're thinking, hey, I just know that this faculty author is working on something, I'm gonna support that person best I can. It quickly scopes into a kind of a programmatic thing. And I think if you're not mindful about what support you're offering, even if it's just about one project, um, you might find yourself overwhelmed. A friendly reminder that whatever decisions you make are not necessarily right or wrong or forever, and that you might want to keep your changing capacity in mind. Now for what I hope will be fun-ish. You may remember in our first Pub 101 meeting, I said that I aimed for a little fun in our time together. And seeing as that we're in February, this is particularly fitting. And I think this is a good Valentine for all the project managers out there. In spite of all I have to do, I'll never be forgetting you. That of course is the message we try to convey to whoever we're working with. But um, again, getting back to this idea of the call for proposals as a capacity communication tool. I'm gonna to extend that metaphor and say, let's think of it, if you will indulge me, as a matchmaking tool. Who are you? What are you looking for? And what do you hope to find in someone else? So I'd like us to spend a few moments considering or imagining what publishing support you're in a position to offer. I'd also like you to think a little bit about the intangibles you'd like to attract. So this might not be something you'd actually put in a call for proposals like friendly person, easy to work with, but it's still good for you to think like, 
okay, when I start evaluating proposals, what other intangible qualities might I be looking for? And then finally, don't need to worry too much about CFP lingo. Uh, we just want to kind of think about putting your good enough match into words. So this may not be, you know, your your dream uh, publishing partner, but your good enough partner. So here's one example of uh, an ad, if you will, a personal ad, a publishing ad that uh, you could come up with. Organized project manager seeks laid back but reliable faculty author to explore new OER publishing support ideas. Ideally comfortable with ambiguity, not easily ruffled. This could be a good ad for someone who's not sure what kind of publishing support they can offer, but they want to explore it. They want to find a good partner for that exploration, but there are not yet a lot of kind of facts on the ground that we know. A second example could be something like this. You eager to try something new and collaborate as partners. Me, clear communicator with lots of ideas, but not a lot of time. Together, we figure out how to publish OER. So on this ad, I have highlighted collaborate as partner. And I think that's really important. I spent several years working in an academic library with faculty on promoting their research, partnering to design programs to showcase what it was they had been doing in their classroom or in their research. And I was always looking for somebody who approached me as a partner and as an equal. I would be supporting their work, of course, but it was really important to me to, to, to have that for my own sense of professionalism. And so, you know, that's why I put that in here. Finally, a third example with a few more facts on the ground. You're already familiar with Creative Commons licenses. You've got an OER draft ready in MS Word and just need some support getting it out there. Me, I've got an editor's eye and an institutional repository. So this ad reflects somebody who knows what they've got. They've got an IR, they've got an editor's eye. And so perhaps they're used to working in Word. That's the kind of document they're looking for. And maybe they only want to work with faculty who have been through an open textbook workshop with them. So they already have a familiarity with licenses. It's up to you. So hopefully with those three examples, you can come up with an ad for your publishing program. So please take five minutes, write an ad for your publishing match. This is just between you know, the two of you, although I will ask uh, for all of you to share or any of you to share if you're willing. Please be sure to include what you're looking for and what you offer. And if you can have a little fun, and I promise this isn't just about fun, it's also about kind of getting into a mindset for uh, what Karen will be talking about with Call for Proposals. So I'm gonna set a timer, and then I just ask each of you to you know, open your notes or use your notepad and draft an ad. If you have any questions or you wanna see a different slide, please let me know in the chat. Otherwise, I will mute and we will begin.
Okay, everybody, take one more minute and then we will regroup. Okay, that was our five minute exercise on reflecting on a good publishing match. Thanks to Rebecca who put her good enough publishing match ad in the chat. Library team with publishing and editorial experience willing to support faculty wanting to figure out how to publish our institution's first OER publication and then help train other faculty. Thank you, Rebecca. Very clear about how you sort of imagine this progressing. Also some enthusiasm comes through, so hopefully like will attract like. Dr. Reinhard, me, faculty with ideas for open pedagogy projects she wants to develop into an OER. You, a person who understands or is willing to learn about the process of making it happen. Very cool, looking for, um, it's saying what you've got with your ideas and then looking for support and someone who understands or is willing to learn. I see more um, ads coming into the chat, which is awesome. Thank you. Please, everyone, uh, if you're willing to share your ad, please do. If anyone has one that they're tickled with or would like to share, please feel free to unmute. I will pause for a moment and um, love to hear your voice and, and your ad. Okay, use the chat as preferred. Keep them coming. Um, okay, that's what we just did. If you wanna read yours, feel free to interrupt. Um, takeaways, call for proposals is a communication tool. This is you know, what I've already said a few times in our time together. It's a chance to communicate what you're looking for, what you're providing, and then set the tone of your relationship. And it's also a reminder, just like in our personal lives, not every project partner is going to be a match. In other words, you might say, hey, it's not you, it's me. I don't think this is gonna work out. I have a feeling Karen may touch on that uh, as she talks about calls for proposals, but um, please keep that in mind and feel free to admire one another's ads in the chat. So without further ado, um, I am going to hand things over to Karen. Karen is the head of digital initiatives and scholarly publishing at Portland State University. But before I do that, we're just going to do a quick poll together. So I'm going to stop sharing my screen and toggle on over. And with any luck, you are looking at a poll on your screen. First question, if you're launching an open textbook publishing program, where are you at in your plans? Are you early? You've got good intentions, you're talking about it. Are you mid? You have identified funding perhaps and what you want from the program. Are you ready? You've set a date, you're doing this or never. We're not doing this. We're not planning on publishing. Uh, totally fine, still very welcome to be here. Number two. Have you ever created a call for proposals for any kind of program whatsoever? It doesn't need to be publishing. Yes or no, or I'm not sure because it's hard to remember anything anymore. Totally fine and understandable. Number three, our final question. If you have created a call for proposals, 
did you ever receive responses for the CFP that did not fit what you were looking for? In other words, you're like, where did this come from? Where did they get the idea that I would be interested in this? Is there something we could have done better? Or it, sometimes this happens. I still see responses coming in. About 75% of you have voted. I'll wait another moment here. So many fun ads in the chat. Okay, I'm going to end the poll. I'm going to share the results. And here you can see most of you are early. You have good intentions about launching an open textbook publishing program, about 67%. Coming in second is never. No, thank you. We're not planning on publishing. Number two, almost a perfectly even split between people who have and have not created CFPs in the past. And most of you or aren't sure, you may have received responses that you were not looking for. So with all of this in mind, I will now turn things over to Karen who Hello. will share her wisdom. Hello. Yes, it is. Oh, I think maybe this person is not meaning to be unmuted. Okay, Karen. Yes, hello. Yeah, take it away. <laughs> I will take it away. So I'm just going to share my screen. Um, and go into present. Okay, so everyone should be seeing my slides here in a moment. Are we all good? Okay, perfect. I see some head nods. So as Karen said, I'm going to be talking about community, communicating capacity and expectations um, and using a call for proposal to do that. Oops. So my pronouns are she, her, and hers. And I am the head of digital initiatives and scholarly publishing at Portland State University in Portland, Oregon. I manage the institutional repository, PDX Scholar, and I lead the university's open access textbook initiative, PDX Open. So as the project lead, I'm fully invested in ensuring that all of our faculty authors have a positive experience and are able to successfully complete their open textbooks. Since the inception of PDX Open in 2013, we have supported and published 26 open access faculty authored open access textbooks. And we actually have uh, three more that are in the pipeline that will be published hopefully within the next year. So capacity informs your call for proposal. Capacity, you know, your call for proposal, as Karen has said, communicates your program design. And when you think about your call for proposal as your first opportunity to communicate your pro programmatic capacity and author expectations. I don't know why I can't say programmatic, programmatic. Uh, that's a tongue twister, but it's really, again, as Karen said, and as I will be saying throughout this presentation, it's really about communicating who, what your program is and what the expectations are. So the call for proposal provides your program that opportunity to set priorities and expectations as I've already said. So it's typically how faculty first hear about your publishing program. And it really does provide that opportunity to communicate to potential partners, your program's goals and targeted outcomes. It is, as Karen said at the very beginning of the session, your program's dating profile. So the call for proposal not only sets that overall tone, it defines the spirit of your project and having the spirit of your project well-defined will be extremely helpful as you move forward and really start to work with your faculty authors. In my experience, it's really important to be clear and provide detailed information in your call for proposal. I'll actually be showing you in upcoming slides the evolution of PSU's call for proposal and the level of detail we now include. So your CFP should include what courses or disciplines your program is targeting, the services and level of funding that you'll be offering, as well as information about the selection process and timeline for project completion. I would also recommend that you include uh, that you include sort of what you will be requiring grantees to do, for example, providing training workshops, um, will they be required or are they optional? Uh, the number of in-person check-ins, as well as the funding that will be distributed. 
So I'll be speaking more about all of these shortly. Um, your call for proposal also informs your author agreement or your MOU, which will be covered in another session. There are many open textbook publishing CFPs out there, so always look at what others have done. I actually did this when I first got started because to be perfectly honest, I really had no idea what I was doing. And I really wanted to look at what others had been, had been doing before me. And it was so helpful and so informative. It is also really important to draft a new CFP with each round that you do. Priorities shift and change, and there's always something you missed or that needs to be, uh, that needs more clarity or detail. And I think also this is where it comes with when you launch your CFP and you get, you know, uh, proposals coming in and you start looking at them and you're like, wait, why, why is this included in this? Or where, you know, we weren't really intending to, to, you know, open it up to this area, but yet, you know, it, it's sort of that like way to really be able to clearly define um, what, you know, what you're expecting. So as I mentioned in the previous slide, before you release your call for proposal, you'll want to think about and decide what the focus of your grant program will be. And this is really important. Essentially, creating your CFP is a lot about answering questions. The decisions that you make not only provide the framework for your CFP, but it also informs your selection criteria. So let's get started. You'll need to ask yourself, the questions of will it be, who will you be encouraging to apply and does your program have a specific focus? So for example, will you be encouraging faculty who teach first year courses? Is your focus on high enrollment? Will your program focus on a particular discipline or area? Or is the focus of your OER program to support inclusive learning? So for example, our latest CFP at PSU we wanted to target high enrollment courses. So we designed our CFP around that goal. One thing we needed to define was what was meant by high enrollment. After a lot of consultation, so this took a bit of work because my institution actually doesn't define high enrollment. So after a lot of consultation with the registrar's office, as well as other institutional partners, we defined high enrollment courses as ones that had approximately 500 students annually. So it took us a while to land on this number, but it was really definitely worth it in the end. It's also important to include how participants are going to report progress. So will you be requiring regular one on one check ins? Are there going to be group monthly meetings? Will you be offering workshops? How will grantees share their successes or talk about their challenges? So at Portland State, we require grantees to participate in an OER workshop and regular one-on-one -on -one meetings. So the OER workshop is where the grantees have the opportunity to meet each other. Our workshops happen within the first six months of the grant cycle, but it also is where I start to have the authors think about copyright, creative commons, and accessibility. So author expectations. You must clearly define what services your program will, will provide this is really, really important. Authors need to know what they are getting into. And you also need to know what services you are going to be providing. So there are a few questions that I recommend answering um, that will really help you frame this portion of your call for proposal, as well as this portion of your program. So will your open textbook authors just write their book? or will they be responsible for editing their book? Will authors be responsible for clearing copyright, or will your program provide assistance with this? So at PSU, many of our textbooks are language education and they required international copyright clearance. So while we worked closely with the authors to draft the copyright clearance permission letters, we required the authors to request the permissions themselves. And the reason being is, as I said, many of these were language, language textbooks. One of them in particular is our most recent textbook that was actually written for high level Russian. And the author was using primary sources from Russia. And in order to verify that we had permission, she actually had to reach out to the copyright clearance office that was in Moscow. 
not knowing anything about Russian copyright, really, you know, not even speaking Russian, I did not feel comfortable going out and reaching out to the to the Russian Copyright Office, whereas the author actually had family living in Moscow. So she was able to work with her family to be able to get in touch with the Moscow Copyright Office and be able to work with them directly. And the same, ha same thing happened with uh, one of our French textbooks as well, where the French, uh, the, the material used in the book was uh, primary sources uh, that were published in France. So the, the authors actually wrote to the, the French Copyright Office and worked with them directly. And it was just so much easier to be able to do it that way. But we provided them all of the guidance on what they should be asking and, and the permissions that we were requesting. So during that author creation process, will the library assist the author with pedagogical questions? Or does the university have an instructional designer that you can refer them to? At Portland State, the library does not answer pedagogical questions. Instead, we actually refer them to our instructional designers that are in a different office at the university. Do you have in-house expertise? Is there staff in your library or at your university that could do copyright, that could do copy editing or design? Does that person have the capacity to take on the extra work? Would you charge for these services? If you don't have an in-house expert, how will authors, will authors be responsible for finding editors and designers, or will this be something that your program will handle? How will you handle textbook peer review? Will your books be double blind or open peer review? Will your program pay reviewers, or will authors need to pay for reviewers from their stipend? If you decided to do an open peer review, will authors need to find the reviewers? If so, how many can be affiliated with your institution? And finally, will authors be required to set aside a certain amount of funding to be designated towards editorial and production services? So this is something that we just started to do with our newest round of proposals. Each of our authors are now required to set aside a minimum of $2,500 on editorial and production services. So in order to balance out this, we actually increased our overall funding for each project to ensure that the authors were spending that money on design and copy editing. Final product and timeline. So will authors retain their copyrights or will the copyright be transferred to the university? When we originally started our program, the authors had to give their copyright to the university. And thankfully, we've been able to work with our university council uh, in order to verify and ensure that the copyright can actually stay with the authors. And this was actually really important because we were finding that we actually had faculty who didn't want to participate in our program due to the fact that the copyright was going to be going back to the university. So we wanted to be able to find a way to encourage faculty participation. And this was just one of those ways. Um, I can't stress this enough always check with your legal counsel before you release your call for proposal. You really want to ensure that what you're saying is actually legally something you are able to do. You'll also need to address what Creative Commons licensing the textbook will be published under. So will you allow authors to choose a Creative Commons license or will the authors be required to publish under a particular license? What will a completed textbook look like? Will you define the number of pages, the number of chapters? Will each chapter have a set structure? Will your textbooks have a similar style or design? To answer the question about what the final product will look like, we actually included the following statement in our call for proposals. And I quote, a completed manuscript supports the teaching of an entire course, which for us is term, and includes a table of contents, consistent chapter elements and features, footnotes, glossary, et cetera. So as you can see, we clearly said, this is what our final product, this is what we expect our final products to look like. And budget. As Karen already knows, I could talk about budget for hours. Uh, budget is the area that takes up most of my time as a project manager. And I hate to break it to you, it will take up most of your time as project managers. 
Uh, I actually have set up weekly meetings with our budget person in the library to ensure that we are on track with everything. We have a number of spreadsheets and we document every single decision that we make. So here are some of the things to think about when you're writing your call for proposal. How is the budget being distributed? Is it gonna be in one lump sum? Are you going to have it at the beginning, mid, end of the project? Will authors need to meet certain expectations and deadlines to receive payments? Or will you be able to offer departmental buyout? Or will it be a combination? So at Portland State, we actually have two different grant programs. We have a creation and we also have an adopt and adapt program. We've actually gone and have dealt with our budget in two different ways. Our adopt and adapt program, the money is actually distributed out throughout the project. We have the, the grantees receive money at the beginning of the project and then they receive money when they publish their final OER. Whereas in the creation grants, those grantees actually have budgets and they designate how their money is going to be spent out. So we've actually made sure that in our call for proposals, we clearly state that these two separate projects have different budgeting models. And it's really important. Another thing that is important, which I have to stress because when we first started, we did not even consider this until we all of a sudden got, uh, until all of a sudden our Dean came to us and said, uh, what about OPE? And we went, what? OPE, other payroll expenses. When talking about OPE, what I mean are the employer paid taxes such as Social Security and Medicare. So if you're offering a stipend of $2,500, for example, will faculty receive the gross wages of $2,500? Or will they actually only receive $2,000, for example, after taxes and OPE is taken out? How will this affect your overall budget? What I mean by all of this is let's say that you have $30,000 uh, set aside to support faculty authors. Does that $30,000 include OPE or do you need to include an additional allocated amount, uh, amount in order to make sure your OPE is required? If you are paying faculty authors $5,000, will OPE be taken out or will the library or your program be supplementing that? It is really important to make sure you figure that out because it can impact your budget dramatically. You also have to think about what other type of expenses, what type of expenses can be paid for? And is there anything that you're not willing to pay for? So for example, uh, at Portland State, we have actually supported faculty authors to go to conferences to learn about open textbook creation because we've actually seen it as being really important part of the process. Um, but, you know, we, one of our authors wanted to purchase a laptop and, and we decided not to pay for that. So there's a lot of things to consider with the budget. Um, and this is probably one of the most complicated areas. And I always recommend that you work directly with a budget analyst in order to figure this out um, because it can really make or break your, your program and the perspective of authors. If authors are expected to get paid at a certain time and because you are behind or because you're, you haven't quite fully figured out your budget and you don't pay them for six months, let me tell you, that can really wrinkle and, and put a kink in your project and, and the perspective. So it is really important to, to be able to look and figure that out as well as document document what you've decided, document why you've decided it, because it'll be very important when you start writing your call for proposal, or if you do have follow-up questions, you have something to point to because these decisions have been made before, and I can't stress that enough. So I'll move on from budget, just because I could continue longer. Um, so I wanted to kind of talk about and show you uh, the evolution of Portland State University's call for proposals. So this was our call for proposal in 2016. It actually was our call for proposal for our, our 2013 and 2014. Um, we, we were going broad. We were like, we wanna work with anybody. We're super excited. I don't think people are gonna wanna participate. So we're gonna cast a really wide net. And you know, 
it worked pretty well. Um, we did get a lot of you know, proposals, um, but we ran into difficulties and problems. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll briefly talk about that when you see sort of how we evolved. But as you can see here, you know, we were just aiming for high enrollment courses, but we didn't define what that meant. We only had $2,500, so we were really hoping people <laughs> wanted to work with us. Um, you know, and, and we just really had some of basic requirements, like, you know, a textbook title, a statement of purpose, um, you know, a statement of support from the departmental dean or, or chair, which is really important, um, you know, an estimated length, but we, we really didn't ask for writing samples, we didn't ask to see how far somebody actually had with their book. Um, and, you know, we, we got some really great, great proposals, but we also ran into problems, as I said, as I've said. So this is, <laughs> this is where we're evolving to. Uh, so this is just the first page of our call for proposal. It actually goes into a second slide. But as you can see here, uh, we've broken down our grant amounts. We've defined what the minimum, the grant funding will be, uh, that 2,500 would be designated towards. Here's what the eligibility criteria for high enrollment looks like. We included project timelines. Uh, we also included what grantees are going to be required to do. So they have to participate in long range assessments. They're going to have to deposit their books under a certain Creative Commons license. Uh, we clearly define what a successful proposal looks like. So as you can see, we went from casting a really wide net to being like very focused and saying this is who we want to work with. Um, and I will say that while it is a lot of detail, it has provided some really well thought out very good proposals that can meet our timelines. So when I talk about the problems that we had, one of the major issues that we have run into is uh, the stretching out of timelines. Um, I have a faculty author who is currently in her fifth year of working on her book because we didn't have any way to try to push her along. And I didn't, you know, I didn't, she started completely from scratch. And I was so afraid of burnout because we can't do buyout. So faculty have to do all of their other responsibilities beyond writing an open textbook that we're now in her fifth year. And I'm still trying to figure out how, how we close out this project. We've also had projects that have started with the bang. And next thing you know, I don't hear it all from the author. I can't get in touch with them. They're not responding to my emails. And it's because we just didn't have those really set and defined deadlines and check-ins and ways to hold our authors accountable. And I, I don't like to talk about it in these terms, but I think in order to have a successful project and to ensure that these projects are done in a timely manner, that you do have to set those levels of um, check-ins and timelines, because I think they're really important. The other thing that is also really important is to ensure accessibility, in particular with ADA compliance. So that's one of the newer things that we've also been integrating into our requirements as well. So lessons learned. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> um, the main one is to create an FAQ. If it's not only just for yourself, it's for, uh, for all the authors who, or people who wanna participate. You know, what we have done with our FAQ, it's actually become an internal document because when we write our call for proposals, we actually write two separate copies. We have a, one that's a public facing and then we have one that's an internal facing. And our internal facing has really become sort of our frequently asked questions and we've thrown everything in the kitchen sink in our internal one. So if we have authors that come back to us and have very specific questions, we can go back to that internal call for proposal and say, yes, this is what we've defined. Yes, this is how we're doing this. Yes, this is what we're doing. Um, but it also allows us to have this breathing living document that we're changing as, as you know, as, uh, as our projects go and, and things change. We've talked about putting our FAQ um, sort of more public facing, 
But our proposals have changed so much that we've just found that what we want to do is engage with those authors over email and over chat and really figure out and define and work with them right at the get go, rather than pointing them to an FAQ. We just really want to have those those conversations right away. And I have found that that is really what um, can that that sort of pushes uh, our authors into doing that proposal if they can have that conversation with me right away. So that's the reason why I haven't put an FAQ sort of as an external public facing. Um, have a clear selection criteria and rubric and make sure that you include you know, the criteria in your call for proposals. This will really help your selection process. Um, as Karen said, it is okay to reject proposals. We initially were very hesitant about saying no, just because I wanted anybody or anything to, <laughs> any sort of projects to be able to participate, but I now do say no. Um, and I say no, because it doesn't meet the spirit of the project or it clearly is not meant to be an open textbook. That is really the main reason why we say no is when projects come to us, they're not designed, it's not designed to be a textbook. It's designed to be a website or something else. And I refer them to the instructional designers at our Office of Academic Innovation and they work with them in order to make sure that, you know, what they, what they really need or want for their class can be fulfilled. So it's really about making sure that it does meet the needs of your project, it meets the focus. Um, because it is a real bummer, and I've had to do this a couple times, where I've actually halfway through a project, I've had to stop it. I've had to say, this project isn't working, you're not responding to me, uh, you're not meeting deadlines. And that is actually a harder thing to do, and I would prefer not to do that. So that is why I think it's so much better and easier just to say, no to a proposal. The other thing is I have rejected proposals and then in a year they've come back and it's been a better proposal. It's been more well thought out, it's been researched. The faculty has taken really a lot of time and energy to get a better well thought out proposal um, to us. And so in the end, it actually works out uh, much better for everyone. So as Karen has said, and as I have, have, I probably have said many, many times, this really is your opportunity to create your awareness on campus. You know, you're really defining why faculty should participate in care. What are the benefits of part are participating? You know, what expertise as program managers do you bring to the program? And what are sort of the opportunities to be able to create campus partnerships? And I think the campus partnerships are really important. Um, we've actually created a lot of campus partnerships due to our open textbook that we would have never have had uh, before. So it's just a really great way to, to be able to put the library out there as being front and center on campus and saying, look, you know, we, you know, look at all the various services and the expertise we have to offer. So again, as I have said, uh, this is more of a, a, a reiteration, um, really the, the CFP questions to consider. Do you want to, uh, to evaluate writing samples as part of the application criteria? Do you wanna work with multiple authors or just the lead author? Beyond writing a text, do you, you know, what do you want to support? For example, um, illustrations, interactive experiences, videos. Will you provide tech support of any type? Um, do you wanna require peer review? And do you wanna ensure that someone else um, has actually reviewed the project? For example, a copy editor. And then the reflections. I think I will open it up, Karen, for questions. Sounds good, thank you, Karen. We have a few already in the chat. Uh, first was a reiteration from Brittany, who was very thankful that you mentioned OPE. She shared her story, we didn't know about it and our finance department didn't mention it and we blew a grant budget by about $20,000. So thanks for mentioning it and thanks Brittany for sharing that story. That sounds like a rough time. Yeah, our, um, our when we discovered we hadn't uh, gone and uh, included OPE, ours was 15,000 that we were over budget. And for state institutions, it's really hard to try to find a spare $15,000. Yeah. Yeah, that's tough. So John has a great uh, question about what is a healthy amount of time to complete an OER textbook? So I usually say you have to give authors, um, if you, so if 
if you are able to do course buyout, so that means that you could pay for the faculty member to not teach, I would say that you could give uh, an author a year. You could give a faculty member a year. If the faculty member is required to continue their teaching load on top of writing an open textbook, I usually say anywhere between two and a half to three years. Most of our faculty authors actually write their books during the summer. Uh, so we usually try to do it as like a summer kind of grant um, and that's where the main focus is. So for non buyouts, it's usually about two and a half to three years. Yeah, and I'll just add, this is one of those questions where uh, it depends is a good answer. I also hear stories of faculty acting, you know, independently seizing the summer as Karen mentioned, and they've written a textbook in three months or they've used um, the opportunity in their class to engage their students in creating mm -hmm. it. And so maybe it's done, you know, in one semester and then polishing in a second semester. So part of that is defined um, by your capacity and the needs of your program, but it really can run the gamut. Traditionally, um, I think the timelines Karen is talking about in years is uh, more typical. And we have Karen, I just want to say, so we currently have an author um, that is writing the textbook as she is teaching. So her textbook will actually be completed in the academic year. But what she's going to do is use this, she's currently using this academic year to review the textbook and have the students review it because she wrote it and then like she literally wrote it and then taught it that same week. So she wrote each like section right before she had to teach the section. So now she's going back and making changes and getting feedback from, from the students. So the students are actually getting the cost savings measure, even though the book isn't officially published because they don't have to purchase any course materials. And what you're describing really highlights one of the things that's really exciting about open ed, which is that direct feedback between author and key audience. That author is getting all the feedback from her students as she's developing the material, which sounds like it would be really fun, potentially. Um, <laughs> Rebecca or stressful. Asks, or stressful, both. Um, Rebecca asks, can you share what your first project budget was for those of us starting out? What is realistic to ask our administration to put aside for our first year and project? So we, when we first started out, um, we offered $2,500 uh, for open textbook creation. And I would say that that was underfunding the projects. Um, I would estimate that you want to spend anywhere between five to $8,000 per project um, as a way to offer compensation to authors. So given that, what we have done is um, we've said, okay, you know, let, we want to, we can manage five projects. So, you know, if you have a, a budget of, you know, 5,000 to, to 8,000, you just multiply that by five. And what is that? $25,000? My math, right? Five times five. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, you know, I, I would say you need anywhere between 20 to $30,000 to set aside to support authors. Um, we actually at Portland State University, um, our money is actually coming from our foundation. So everything that we have spent on our open textbook project is actually um, is, is, is donor funded. So we are our money is not actually coming from the library budget. It's all been uh, donor donor funded. So that's how we've been able to do it. But that means right now, unfortunately, due to the pandemic and other uh, factors, we actually have, we've run out of money. So we're currently not able to offer any grants currently because we don't have, because we don't have an allocated budget for it. And that's something that Millie's commenting on in the chat, asking how under-resourced colleges can afford uh, budgets like 20 to $30,000, which uh, is absolutely the reality. And so again, that's where so many different publishing models yeah. If we were to survey sort of across the United States, we'd see a lot of different models, one of which could be, um, you know, hey, if you write it, I'll be here to answer questions as they come up and we can put it in the IR. 
or, hey, we've taken a look and we want to do this number of courses. And so maybe we focus all of our funding on a tool, Pressbooks, for instance. And then that's where the budget goes. Yeah. You might still be able to find faculty authors who want to do this uh, without a stipend. Like there's so many different ways to kind of slice this pie. There's a lot of flexibility. Um, but I know that these kind of numbers are really overwhelming. And what Karen's talking about, um, sort of connecting it to Amanda's conversation last week, is a service editorial service oriented model. They are talking about designers and copy editors and um, sort of a, a team of people working on these resources. And that may not be the case. And it doesn't have to be the case at um, every institution. There really can be a lot of different ways to do it. What we're trying to show um, in Pub 101 is how publishing has worked in the past and then talk about ways that we can kind of break that model or think differently to find ways to make it happen. But it also could be possible that um, it's, it's can happen right now too. That's also sometimes the reality. So I, and, I appreciate that. And I do wanna add on to this, Karen, is the fact that you know our PDX Open not only includes those that we have supported, but if you look at our institutional repository, we have a number of projects that faculty have done on their own. And they have gone and you know have, have published their own work or have been creating work and just want it published and out there. Um, we're also looking at other ways to be able to fund authors, you know, even just offering, you know, just a small level of support and saying, hey, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll pay $500 for you to, you know, do sort of an OER sprint. Why don't you focus on your OER for a week this summer or two weeks in the summer and we'll just you know pay you some level of funding in order to do that so it's also about you know just trying to find creative ways to be able to meet these authors um, but you know you also need to remember that the creation of the oer is free to publish but the work involved is not free um, you do need to be cognizant of making sure that you are compensating faculty for their labor and, you know, and trying to find creative ways around that. Thanks, Karen. I'll just note in the chat that that Marilyn um, at UMass Amherst is saying similarly that if faculty are investing a large amount of time, she didn't feel comfortable with twenty five hundred dollars. Um, given what they're investing in the process. So it really does depend so much on local context. And um, Jess mentioned she's looking for angel investors. So I know that budget is a huge consideration. So we're we have actually, oh, I was gonna say, Go we're actually thinking of doing mini grants, like this idea of like, you know, how like they have GoFundMe campaigns. We're actually looking at talking to our foundation about seeing if we can create some level of a GoFundMe campaign for an open textbook and what that would look like. Um, so if you do have some type of foundation associated with your university, I definitely recommend starting a convert or having your dean start a conversation with them. Thanks. Um, so Linda mentions or asks, would it be effective to start with just an adopt or adapt program to get faculty exposed to it and less work and less budget? You could still target high enrolled courses. Yes. So. <laughs> Karen is a firm supporter in that. Um, it's true, publishing is, a, I think, a very um, heavy lift to start with. If you're just starting your open ed program, an adoption program might make more sense to you know, increase awareness and all of the, all of the things. Um, Amanda, thank you for some of your thoughts in the chat to that same question. Uh, since we're running out of time, I, I will uh, not run through it again. Um, uh, Lisa asked um, something similar. Oh, I have a faculty member who has a book idea and wants to forge ahead. We have no money for a publishing program. How realistic or unrealistic is this? I mean, I I would say have a conversation with with the faculty member. Um, see, you know what it is they're creating, and you know you could offer copyright clearance guidelines. You could you know, look at, do you have instructional designers that, that you could refer them to? Um, is there, you know, do they know any students that are looking for like any level of like extra credit work or maybe your department, maybe that department hires, 
you know, has a student budget? Could they, you know, utilize the student to be able to help them with their textbooks? So that would be a win-win for, you know, your program as well as then for the students, as well as for the author. I mean, I would say engage as much as possible and try to try to provide as many services as possible um, that you can. I mean, one of my authors currently is it has been creating a textbook in Google Doc for years. Um, and it's just been kind of chipping away at it and uses it as sort of supplemental and just keeps growing it. So it's something that they have been creating, I think for like the past eight to 10 years. And it's just because they're so passionate and their textbook that they were using wasn't meeting their needs. And so they just started creating this Google Doc and then they've shared it with their, their students. Their students have participated in it. Um, and it's really about too figuring out, is it an open pedagogy? Um, could they actually have their students help them create it? Um, there's some really good examples of open textbooks that have been created with the assistance of students. Thanks, Karen. I think that is kind of a nice place to wrap up because it brings us back around to this idea of partnership and really sitting down and talking about ideas and, and sharing your areas of expertise with faculty and well defining what it is you can do to support them within uh, you, the resources that you have as an individual or financially in your department or your library. Um, so I, I really like this idea of just trying to find those, those places of connection, if you will, where what you're able to offer is something that that person needs. And it might just be brainstorming, sitting down together, gosh, you know, if, if I had all the world, I would be able to offer you this, but I don't. And so what I can offer you is an hour together thinking about how we might be able to move forward. So um, Susan's asking for some examples. I will look for some of those and um, chat with Karen about it and put them in the class notes along with this chat so that um, you have this resource. Please join me in thanking Karen for her time and, and sharing the story of making textbooks at Portland State. Thank all of you for your excellent questions and your engagement and your willingness to go with us on this uh, matchmaking journey. I hope you're not too discouraged. There are lots of ways to work together and support one another as we figure this out. So. Until we meet again next week, best wishes.